This is how Kraut opens his video on how Denmark invented social democracy, by slamming a stack of books onto his desk that includes Why Nations Fail and The Origins of Political Order. There's a lot of problems with his use of sources when it comes to history, chief of which is that it's almost all political science. We'll talk about that in detail later on in the video. Out of the stack, he pulls The Great Leveler, probably the best book in the stack for a history video being that it's the only one written by an actual historian. The thesis of The Great Leveler is that periods of long peace lead to growing inequality, which is only erased by periods of great political turmoil, such as the First World War and the Russian and Chinese revolutions. The thesis of her work is the central argument. It's the discovery you made during your research. The entire body of work exists to convince the audience that this is the right interpretation of the evidence you surveyed. That's how you work with history. Every good historian, and even writer in general, knows what their thesis is, and is consciously working towards it throughout their work. Usually it's hinted at early on, and then you return to it towards the end of the work in order to hammer it home. However, if you don't know the thesis of your work, you can end up actually accidentally indicating multiple different theses and themes that you never intended to communicate in the first place. Everything in the video exists to reinforce the thesis, but if your thesis is confused, the messaging of your work is also confused. And it didn't come to be through class struggle as Marxist theory demands, but through cold weather. We're going to analyze what Kraut's message is, what sort of thesis is trying to convey with his videos, and how it fits into a larger, somewhat under-communicated ideological project. This video was a lot more challenging to make than some of my past videos where I've talked about figures on the far right. While Kraut was a member of the far right skeptic community and an anti-feminist and Islamophobe, he also at times confronted the more extreme right-wing views that he found objectionable. Eventually, this led to a falling out with the more extreme right-wing elements of that community, causing him to distance himself from them. While he's dropped the Islamophobia and general overt gross behavior he used to engage in, he's still as politically engaged as ever on social media and in his videos. He just downplays it in the videos, where most of his attacks on the left, on Marxism or similar things, comes as passing remarks or as underlying themes in his video's central thesis. I'll stress this multiple times throughout this video, there is nothing wrong about producing political content, and there is nothing wrong about having an opinion on history. Nowadays, Kraut is center-right, and much of what he says sounds reasonable at a surface level. Everything needs a lot of unpacking, in order to understand how he's not really teaching history so much as simultaneously creating an impression of history and wielding that impression to communicate a political message. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. The other day I was trying to listen to my favorite rendition of the Star Spangled Banner from a YouTube account with 767 subscribers. Turns out I'm not allowed to do that in my country. Had I been using a VPN, I could have fooled YouTube into thinking I was connecting from the greatest country on Earth, Miami. With that, I can access the Star Spangled Banner as well as all other US-specific region-locked content. Same applies for other countries. If you'd want to watch any shows produced by the Norwegian State Broadcasting Corporation, for example, you can do so using a VPN as well. Freedom isn't free. You can grab the most affordable VPN deal on the market with Atlas VPN Premium for $1.83 a month, plus 3 months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This is a limited-time summer deal you can grab by clicking the link in the video description. Atlas VPN allows you to access searches without location-based tracking data altering your search results. It also allows you to take advantage of region-specific deals or avoid region-specific price gouging on online stores. Atlas VPN also blocks malicious links, ads, and trackers and notifies you when someone's trying to steal your data. Best of all, one subscription lets you protect unlimited devices, so all of your burner phones that you use to register new Twitter accounts after being being suspended for glorifying violent behavior are covered by Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN does not condone this behavior, and neither do I. I love you, Elon Musk. Changing the name of your platform to X, deleting one of the most recognizable brands in the world was an excellent business decision. Please don't ban me again. During the summer deal, you can get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra. You get a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you protect your data from Google and corporations for a price less than a Big Mac a month. You can grab this deal by clicking the link in the video description. This is a limited time offer. We're going to examine two of his history-oriented videos in order to highlight the ways in which his approach to history, quite frankly, sucks. The first being how Denmark invented social democracy. As you might tell from my accent, I'm Norwegian. I've also done archival research on primary sources regarding the government surveillance of the social democrats in Norway and Sweden during the interwar years. We're also going to look at his video called The History of Russian Authoritarianism, which has many glaring problems for a history that is supposed to explain how Russia got to where it is today, chief of which is almost entirely skipping the Soviet era and the 19 1990s, which saw the transformation of the Russian Federative Socialist Republic into the Russian Federation and the creation of the oligarch class. But while there are specific issues, there are also far more general problems that we'll have to address. I spent some time earlier talking about how your thesis can easily get confused if you don't fully know what you're trying to say. This is very apparent in this video. First, listen to this. Scandinavian communities started to create communal institutions for the wider benefit of their society run by them and trusted by them earlier than anywhere else. 
This is an aspect often mischaracterized and misunderstood by outsiders. Infamously, the American far right likes to deride this aspect of Scandinavian society as communism, even though it came into existence centuries before Marx was even born. Equally false, Marxists enjoy describing it as socialism, even though its establishment during medieval feudalism contradicts Marxist theory of history and developmental stages, and it didn't come to be through class struggle as Marxist theory demands, but through cold weather. Then about two minutes after, he says this. The aristocracy was in theory meant to represent the general public, but in most cases the aristocracy used the parliamentary assemblies to gain power at the expense of the king to then take advantage of the peasantry. As Lutheranism spread among the peasantry and low nobility, it set them up against the aristocracy and the Catholic bishops. Civil war broke out, and using the support of a Protestant peasantry and lower nobility, Christian III seized the Danish throne in 1536. This sounds a lot like it involved a struggle between the classes of the aristocracy and the peasantry, with the aristocracy wielding the implements of the state against the peasantry. He claims that, while most of Europe exited feudalism with political conflict between an aristocracy and monarch over the establishment of an absolutist state, Scandinavia exited feudalism with a significantly more empowered peasantry than the rest of Europe. This is an interesting claim considering Scandinavia, just like the rest of Europe, took an absolutist turn during the Age of Enlightenment, and Denmark explicitly disempowered the peasantry in this period. Denmark somewhat uniquely actually instituted a form of serfdom around the rough era that others were abolishing it. In 1733 the king instituted the Stavnsbon, which required all males aged between 18 and 36 to remain on the estates of their birth and take up tenancies there when required. Landowners resisted reform to the system due to how it might wrest traditional forms of control out of their hands. The first third of the video is about various developments in medieval Scandinavia, which he draws a long and tenuous connection from to modern social democracy. Essentially, he says that, due to various factors, our entire culture became more inclusive and collectively minded than other societies. He claims this sort of development occurred in Scandinavia before anywhere else, of course citing zero sources for this claim. The general focus on communal living and mutual aid that Kraut describes in medieval Scandinavia was actually the norm, not the exception, for local communities in the Middle Ages. Peasants in both Scandinavia and elsewhere all varied in wealth and social standing, but all belonged to the same social group. They were the ones who labored, and this laboring class pooled and shared its food and resources for the betterment of the community. There were specific quirks to Scandinavian medieval society for sure, but peasants everywhere made adaptations to deal with seasonal or political troubles, and most of the time these adaptations relied on humanity's biggest strength, our social bonds and capacity for collective effort. Kraut says this developed first in Scandinavia before for anywhere else in the world. This is a very specific claim that requires elaboration on what constitutes this sort of development. Because of the specific nature of the claim, one would imagine he read this somewhere and so it would not be very hard to cite evidence for this. If he did cite it, we could discuss the terms of analysis for what constitutes this sort of development, and whether or not the analysis is good. Maybe the analysis only includes European countries, rendering it Eurocentric and inaccurate. Or maybe Kraut is misusing this source because it doesn't really say what he's claiming it does. We will never know. I don't think he's right on this, but since he was so non-specific about what qualifies as this sort of development, there really is no way to to prove or disprove this claim. This lack of specificity, coupled with no source citation, means that there's no way to fully know what he meant. So you can choose to fill in the blanks yourself, meaning that the message can be agreeable to as many people as possible. He's not teaching you history, he's trying to get you to agree with him. This is how politicians speak. A big part of this thesis is that a lot of these lucky developments in Scandinavia enabled us to choose a different path towards egalitarianism than struggle or conflict. However, this is an outright lie. Where we've ended up today is somewhat different from a lot of other countries like the United States, France or Spain. However, our general long-form path to our destination was more or less the same as the other countries I just mentioned. While in the rest of Europe, industrialization led to poor houses, strict moral codes, struggles with unions, fear of revolution, Marxist movements and strikes, in Denmark it resulted in in a political debate over the Arbeitersporksmal, the worker question. There was no shortage of struggle or conflict in Denmark, Sweden and Norway. He's outright lying here, downplaying the very important part played by unions, strikes and Marxist movements in the labor struggle for things like welfare, the 8-hour workday and various other rights afforded to the working class because they fought for them. 
1871 saw a historic wave of strikes across Denmark. In 1872, brickmakers called a strike to reduce the working day from 11 to 10 hours. The Danish government used soldiers and police to attempt to forcefully end the strike, which led to an open brawl, which has since been called the Battle of Falun. In 1876, the Danish trade unions met in Copenhagen and established a common socialist political program based on the German Gotha program of 1875. In 1885, the employers organized a lockout of all metal workers with the aim of destroying the unions once and for all for which they hired an army of scabs. In 1898, the Trade Union Congress was formed and was explicitly linked to the Danish Social Democratic Party, with both organizations having representatives on either one's executive committee. The unions and the Social Democratic Parties in Scandinavia have since this period always had strong links, to the point of sometimes acting as a single political entity. He goes on to talk about how Danish social welfare initiatives constituted the very first welfare state in the late 1800s. He specifically mentions something similar happening in Germany under Bismarck, and he does refer to it also as a welfare state. But for some reason, even though those things occurred prior to or contemporaneously to the Danish developments, he wants to call Denmark the first welfare state instead. This conflicts with traditional historiography, which would say Germany would be the first example of an early welfare state. He also ignores the very same developments occurring in Norway and Sweden, and that those welfare institutions, just like in Denmark, would remain woefully inadequate until at least the 1930s. Denmark, like no other country, is obsessed with statistics, and that has its origins in the 1890s. The Danes established state institutions that by their design existed to collect data and go out of their way to find problems for the state to solve rather than wait for an unknown problem to fester, grow and become inevitable to confront. This is such a funny way to frame the construction of the surveillance state. As I mentioned earlier, when I chose to do original research, I did so in a field called surveillance studies. And in Scandinavia, the field of surveillance studies explicitly links the construction of the welfare state with the construction of the surveillance state. This development took place everywhere in the West, where society was further bureaucratized and more data was collected on its citizens. This coincided with the development of methodical and systematic collection of data on citizens for other means, such as national defense or a vaguely defined national interest. In Norway and Sweden, this was quickly weaponized against the left, who were viewed with much suspicion in the interwar years following the Russian Revolution of 1917. We're all obsessed with statistics in Scandinavia, and I'd say in the rest of the world as well. I don't think Kraut is right in characterizing this as a particularly Danish thing. Again, there's no source for Denmark being more obsessed with this than anyone else. During the interwar period, Denmark then pioneered something new again, this time through the newly developed socialist movement specifically for a crisis in socialism caused by the First World War. Denmark remained outside of this war, but the way in which industrial workers throughout Europe had cheered for and joined that war, and how socialist parties throughout Europe had joined the cause for war, left the Danish socialist movement dismayed and in an identity crisis. It was proof that there was no such thing as a socialist international, no global workers' movement, but that national interests superseded the social-political demands of factory workers in countries. Once again, a pretty strong claim with zero substantiation, arguing that a difference of opinion or ideological breaks between socialist parties constitutes the non-existence of a fairly substantiated global socialist movement. The inability of the socialist movement to properly confront the reality of World War I in most countries besides maybe Russia, where the Bolsheviks took a hard stance against the war and won much support from it, constitutes a failure of global socialism, but not its non-existence. This was an international movement. What Kraut would have said if he was treating history with respect is that Danish socialists were disillusioned by the experience of World War I, and so chose to abandon the international struggle in favor of focusing on the struggle at home. Or, however, this also grossly oversimplifies the ideological breaks that occurred between the various socialist and social democratic parties in the interwar years, such as the question of revolution versus reform, or the question of whether socialist parties should place themselves under the authority of the so far only quote-unquote successful socialist party in Russia. These were the central axes along which the Russian socialists and Scandinavian socialists came into conflict in the interwar years. Social policies in Denmark were not the result of class appeasement or state control, but common commitment to stability. Again, incorrect. Denmark did not uniquely do this out of a common commitment to the common good. Reform in Denmark, like in pretty much every other country, was carried out by the political elites in positions of power. And in the interwar years, this was particularly done as a means of averting possible revolution and securing the legitimacy of the regime. 
In the ebook Reforming to Survive by Associate Professor Magnus B. Rasmussen and Professor Carl Henrik Knudsen, they explain the reforms of the late 1800s and early 1900s as having only indirectly been accomplished by socialist and social democratic movements, as elites strategically responded to calls for reform in ways that would both shore up support for the regime and alleviate enough of the workers' concerns so as to avert revolt. They argue that countries that most significantly expanded social policy were the ones who most significantly faced revolutionary threats. You should read the book as it, in my opinion, pretty comprehensively debunks this wholesome perspective of cross-class collaboration in favor of the more evidentiary-backed narrative of competing class interests and rights and social policy won through agitation and struggle by social democrats, socialists, liberals, and communists. On the notion of these reforms not happening as a result of state control, I do have to ask, through which mechanisms and institutions were the Danish social policy laws passed, if not through the mechanisms and institutions of the state? And he specifically mentions the expansion of information gathering on Danish citizens as well, which most definitely represented an expansion of state control. Just because the thing the state is doing is good doesn't mean it's not inexplicably an organ of the state. He ends the video by saying that although his videos describe centuries-long developments of institutions, we are not prisoners of history. He laments how many of his audience misunderstand this and end up coming to the opposite conclusion, which for the record is entirely his own fault and we'll talk about that in a moment. However, I will give him props for attempting to clarify his thesis, saying that we are not prisoners of history and that the establishment of these institutions is possible in other countries as well, goes a long way to dispel the notion that the opposite is the case, provided to us by his focus on developments all the way back to the early Middle Ages in Scandinavia. The very final line of narration is, you can get to Denmark. The question only is, should you? Which once again confuses his thesis right after clarifying it. This video so far looked like a sales pitch for the Nordic model. Never did it seem like a frank or objective discussion of its merits or its issues. I can think of two reasons for him putting this in his video. One, this was the original intent of the video, discussing the merits in more detail, but the nature of the video changed while the final line was kept, because he thought it sounded profound despite there being absolutely zero build-up to it. The other, which I think is equally likely, is that he put this line in here to lend the video a sense of objectivity that it does not deserve. He is essentially framing the video as a purely objective recount of the history of Danish social democracy, despite his very selective retelling of events. Then he's using the question as a rhetorical device to get you to consent to his view of history. By asking this question, he's asking you to nod and say, yes, this sounds pretty good, we should do this. Because he never actually highlighted any of the negatives of Scandinavian social democracy. For one, in the Norwegian example, our sovereign wealth fund is based on a fossil fuel industry that is contributing to a rapidly deteriorating climate situation that will make large swaths of the global south unlivable. While Scandinavian social democracy insulates us from being victimized by some of the harsher sides of capitalism, like having to go into significant debt for an education, for healthcare, and so on, like citizens of other countries have to do, it nonetheless still relies on cheap labor from the very same global south. We have padded ourselves against some of the flaws of capitalism, while still being beneficiaries of its global networks of exploitation of historically exploited nations. This is not to indoctrinate you into a Maoist third worldist perspective on the Nordic countries or anything of the sort. I am of course not a Maoist. I'm trying to present some nuance to this conversation on the system under which I live. Uncritically upholding or reinforcing the present state of things isn't how we move forward. We move forward and improve things by being critical of them and highlighting their issues. Scandinavian social democracy has done amazing things for us here in the Nordics. We are beneficiaries of capitalism's exploitation of countries in Africa, South America and Asia, just like the US. But citizens of our countries are reaping more of the benefits. That's the difference. That's not to say it's all exploitation. It of course isn't. But there is lots of it. They're both exploitative. If you're American, you're just also getting fucked alongside the farmer who's getting murdered in Madagascar to get you your vanilla extracts. Instead of worshipping what is, let's maybe think more about how we could build something new without these issues. So yes, the question is, should you get to Denmark? If Kraut had a discussion like this, it would have made for a much more intellectually interesting video in my opinion. One in which one could agree or disagree and have a real conversation. The way Kraut works with history is not good, but it'd be far too easy to just say he's being dishonest, which he is for the record. I think that a lot of his issues stem from a core methodological problem. Note, I don't know if what I'm about to say is factual, I'm merely speculating. When you start working with history as an undergraduate, one of the first things you're inundated with is how you approach a topic with a concrete investigation and method in mind. When you start work on a project, you should always have a question or series of questions for the sources that you wish to have answered. These questions will then limit the scope of your video, and they will help shape the work around the thesis 
which you should arrive at through your investigation. Kraut's videos meander and visit a lot of topics in order to give you a sort of best-of montage of things he found that he thought were cool or good. I think this is a result of him deciding that he's going to teach you the history of a thing and that that's as far as his plan really went. With this approach, the scope of your video is only limited by the scope of available sources, which means that your video is practically going to be infinitely long. Then, as you begin work, you will select for things that you like or find interesting. Not because they are answering the explicit question you have for the sources, but because those things appeal to you. He posted about how a video he's been working on for a while now has ballooned out of control in terms of scope, and this is a characteristic problem stemming from your lack of method when working with history. Trust me, I've had this problem myself when writing my undergraduate thesis and my graduate thesis. But that's not to explain away everything with incompetence, he still made these videos. And although his method led him to mostly focus on things that appealed to him, he himself consciously decided on how to portray those things and what facts to leave out. And so he's not innocent. He still works to glorify those things that appeal to him by selectively telling you aspects of their history that paints them in a very rosy light. He's not trying to teach you about the thing. Specifics aren't very important. They become props and a means to an end. He's trying to get you to agree with an idea relating to the thing he's talking about. He's trying to get you to buy into a vibe. Let's move on to Russian authoritarianism. Like with the Viking connection to Danish social democracy, Kraut draws a connection between the Mongols and Russian authoritarianism. This is a theory with some evidentiary backing, but it's specifically a theory used to explain the rise of the Russian Tsardom and its particular brand of despotism, not as a theory to explain the rise of figures like Vladimir Putin. For the video he cites five books. Two of them are political science and three of them are history books. Lord and Peasant in Russia by Jerome Blum was published 62 years ago. Feudal Society by Mark Bloch was published 84 years ago. The book was published before Germany invaded Poland. The final history book was published 61 years ago, but has received constant revision since then, with the most recent edition being released in 2019, I believe. So I'll give him props for that one, I guess. The sources are the evidence a historian uses to formulate their argument. Without them, the historian is nothing. They may as well be making things up. Kraut never explicitly cites the sources, so he really may actually be making things up, but I'm operating on the assumption that he did read some of these things he's claiming. I just believe that his interpretation of these sources is pretty bad. To give an example, he claims this. The Mongols were a tribal people who who had no state or legal structures that they transferred over to the people they conquered. On page 53 of A History of Russia, which is one of the books Kraut claims to have read for this video, Ryasanovsky and Steinberg says the following. Historians have also documented a wide variety of institutional contributions of Mongol rule, which often persisted into the Muscovite era and beyond. Military weaponry, strategy and formations, especially the cavalry, structures of administration, taxation and law, a system of postal stations, and various commercial and financial practices. If you're going to utilize a source that directly contradicts your argument, you need to engage with that source and explain why you're choosing an alternate thesis over it. In this case, choosing the thesis that was formulated before the beginning of the Second World War, or the one formulated in the late 1950s and early 1960s, is probably not the better option. There's a tendency amongst modern historians to paint the Mongol Empire in a positive light as an institution of trade and tolerance. I don't know where he's getting this from, but on the very same page of Yasunovsky's book, the author mentions an example of two recent historians who have posited a view that sounds something like that, and the book mentions arguments for why this sort of thesis is convincing. Either way, I think he has some gall to be talking about tendencies among modern historians when he cites not a single work by a living modern historian or a single work on the historiography of this subject. Again, literally every single historian he cites is dead. But with the Mongols gone, the newly independent Russia kept the socio-economic and political structures that had developed under Mongol rule and strengthened them. Resanovsky's book says this is one of the most contentious questions of the impact of Mongol rule, and Kraut here passes this off as one objective true account of a very complicated history with many unsettled questions. The Kievan Rus, with its deep cultural and economic ties to the Byzantians, had been the cultural motherland and birthplace of Russia. The place where Russia as a European cultural entity had been created. It remained under Mongol rule for 250 years and went into an entirely different direction. When nomads conquered a settled people, they usually turned into who they conquered. But here, in a weird twist, the conquered Russians almost became Mongols. Frankfurt School theorist Karl Wittfogel posited a thesis of so-called Oriental despotism. Karl Wittfogel as a man alternated politically between Stalinism and seemingly McCarthyism, and in 1957, in his later McCarthyist phase, he published a work called Oriental Despotism. The book sought to explain why certain countries in the East developed differently into despotic regimes as opposed to the liberal developments of the West. The idea draws a harsh demarcation between our Western European way of development and a different quote-unquote Oriental way of development. Although it started a series of conversations that later led to good works, which is a common occurrence, and 
why even terrible works of history do have some value, the book itself has been widely criticized. In 1961, Frederick Mota, an expert on Chinese history, said that Karl Wittfogel, quote, does not write of Chinese government and society as a historian. The reader does not sense any awareness of the steadily cumulative development through the centuries which gave each age its own character. The reason I use this quote and mention Oriental despotism is that Kraut engages in this exact type of behavior. The Mongols and his conception imparted something non-European, something quote-unquote Oriental onto the Russians, making them no longer like us, and so they developed differently. He's not working like a historian, trying to show the unique character of each age. He's rather compressing everything into a long history of the steady development of a single thing, that is, Russian authoritarianism. One can also argue that Kraut's narrative specifically borrows from a Muscovite nationalist mythos intended to justify its own existence and centralization. The narrative of an entirely negative Mongol yoke against which Russia needed to centralize to cast off its oppression was a narrative fronted by Moscow to enhance and legitimize its own power. And it is one that historians generally seek to confront. He goes on to talk about how there was an alternative path in Russia, that of Novgorod, whereby there was a sort of democratic system of government with checks and balances. It is my belief that he overemphasizes the democratic nature of the institution of the Vetsche by selectively relying on certain source information that mentions elections and similar things. He does this just as he did in the Danish example, in order to romanticize and glorify a thing that he likes. In reality, the legislative office often devolved into violent struggles and was likely dominated entirely by the richest merchants and landowners known as the boyars. The leading scholar on the topic refers to Novgorod as a boyar republic, emphasizing elite domination of the Vetsche and of town officials. Again, this is literally in a book that Kraut lists as a source. The commerce-oriented nature of Novgorod led to an ever-increasing disparity of wealth, leading to conflicts between the rich and the poor, which also occurred in many similar commerce-oriented European city-states. When the Moscow prince in 1478 came to conquer Novgorod, the boyars found no defenders among the common people, who seemingly preferred Ivan III to their own oligarchic government. If anything, Novgorod and Moscow both reflect elements of Russian political development. I think one could make an interesting parallel between Novgorod and Russia in the 1990s, when the country's industry and institutions were sold off to foreign corporations leading to the development of an oligarchic class, and how this directly led to Russian people flocking to right-wing strongmen like Vladimir Putin, who presented themselves as someone standing against foreign domination of Russia. He makes many references to continuities between Tsarist Russia, Soviet Russia, and the Russian Federation, but he never really engages with the continuity breaks in the Russian Revolution and the fall of the USSR. There are perhaps continuities to observe, but there are also continuity breaks, and to continuously emphasize the similarity of the USSR and Tsarist Russia or the USSR and the Russian Federation is frankly dishonest and an effort at propagandizing. It doesn't lead to any understanding of the specific circumstances of each era. It only reinforces a particular narrative that these things are the same and that they are bad. Now, I'm not saying Russia today is by any means good. I think my position on the Russian Federation and figures like Vladimir Putin is pretty clear. What I'm saying is, although Kraut is sometimes levying valid critiques, the way he does so leads to a direct deterioration of your understanding of the unique character of periods of history. But that's not a concern for Kraut, because as I said before, Kraut doesn't want to teach you history. He wants you to buy into a vibe. He wants you to say liberal democracy is good. He wants you to say communism is bad. He wants you to say Russia is bad. He wants you to say free trade is good. And so on and so on. Now I'm not seeking to take any stance on any of those positions in this video. I'm just saying that if you're going to make propaganda using history, at least make an effort to teach some good history. He fails at this, and this is why I think Kraut's channel is essentially liberal Prager U. Kraut generally uses a narrow selection of secondary source history books. Secondary sources are, in my opinion, the best thing for YouTube historians to rely on because they can lean on the analysis of experts. Most of his sources, however, are political theory, seeking to promote ideal solutions to perceived contemporary problems. They do so, often problematically, by drawing on our collective history. I say problematically because these people are not historians. They're not writing history for us to learn lessons from history that could be applied in the present. They're writing about contemporary policy solutions and moving backwards from there to find find examples to test their ideas against. As they do so, they're searching for examples in history that confirm or invalidate their theory, and in doing so they attempt to transpose the present onto the past and the past into the present. This can be useful and it can be fun, but it shouldn't be mistaken for history. Using history to understand the present or find solutions in the present isn't a problem in and of itself. It's one of the greatest arguments for the continued study of history. The present is always changing and so we need to constantly reframe and re-examine history to better understand it and relate it 
to the developments happening in the present. As these are political theorists and economists working to find or promote existing policy solutions, they're not apolitical actors. They have a very specific political agenda and a very specific political vision for the world, which they're pushing. And Kraut has chosen these specific political sources because they align with his political agenda and vision for the world. To give an example, fundamentally using the origins of political order by Francis Fukuyama, a proponent of a specific brand of liberalism, who wrote this book to promote that brand of liberalism, is not much different than using Vladimir Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, as a source for history. Francis Fukuyama and Vladimir Lenin must both be understood as having dual roles, as political philosophers, but also as political actors in their contemporary setting. Fukuyama's general political project revolves around elevating capitalism and liberal democracy as humanity's greatest political achievements, and it is his belief that this is essentially the final phase of history. Fukuyama holds that the world is becoming Western. In his view, we figured out the right way to do things before others because our institutions developed in certain ways, whereas others developed in other ways. According to this view, society has a developmental path, and on that path reaches critical junctures. Its goal is to become quote-unquote Western, but some nations end up going down the wrong paths for various reasons, and become viewed as backward for failing to reach Westernization. You can detect how Fukuyama's and other liberal theorists' ideas have suffused Kraut's approach to and thinking regarding history, just like I have been influenced by other theorists. He wields history in order to communicate some of the vague vibes that he found within the works of these theorists that he identified with. I say vague vibes because while he relies heavily on theory, he rarely engages with it, just as he rarely engages with sources in general. I kind of do the same thing, but I hope the difference between me and him is that I tend to depend on literature from the field of history and I engage with it and discuss its merits and flaws. And I also try to do my best to never peddle falsehoods or inaccuracies. Even if I, like everyone else on this website, show you something from history in order to support a narrative or argument, which is the style that history is written in after all, the thing that I'm showing you is true. That's why I cite my evidence down to the page number so you can verify it. Kraut, of course, does not do this. And this is a problem because he makes no shortage of controversial sweeping claims. Citing sources correctly isn't about slavishly adhering to some academic standard for the sake of. It's about centering the knowledge and the sources in a truthful manner that invites critique, and not centering yourself as an arbiter of some objective truth. When you show your work by citing sources, you're saying, if you think I'm wrong, this is how you prove it. When you don't cite sources, you're implying that the knowledge that you're presenting represents some sort of established truth, and that this established truth does not warrant critique. Kraut rarely has a strong thesis, but instead various themes and vibes he wants to communicate, various abstract ideas that he wants you to buy into. These things rarely are communicated specifically and with real factual substance, but instead as subtext within the subjects he's discussing. He will distort an event, period, or polity's history in order to emphasize vague aspects of it that he likes. The point of the video is to get you to buy into those things. His lack of specificity and the diffuse nature of his thesis seems tailored to be acceptable to as many people as possible, with vague positive vibes being the central characteristic of his videos. His videos seem to always have heroes for you to attach your political identity to, and villains for you to revile. It's brilliant propaganda. And again, I wouldn't be upset if he was simultaneously using history appropriately and making the knowledge of his sources more accessible to viewers. But he isn't. He's mostly just doing the propaganda part. His sources are never cited explicitly, but that's par for the course with YouTube history, though the fact that I managed to find multiple instances of him outright contradicting one of his most authoritative sources in a single video makes me feel like he is disinterested in making the knowledge of the sources themselves accessible to the viewer, and instead he's using them as props. What pisses me off is the smugness and self-assuredness with which he does all of these things that I've criticized him of. He's presenting his single view of history as objective, he's obfuscating the historical debates and complexities of history, he's centering himself as an educator instead of the sources on which he's supposed to be relying on. He shows little respect for the work of historians, and for history itself. And that is why Kraut is a bad historian.